Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my turn to do the boff this year. Um, I've got with me uh, Kirill, Wilco, Jabox, and Alex, who are all members of the ARM GNU tour teams. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to answer any questions that you've got. So, it's your boff. What are the questions? <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Could be a very short boff. <laughs> Somebody's wandered off with it. Yeah. Um, Zabosh, I sent you an email just recently um, because I've started going back through the entire old backlog of glibc patches uh, as a way to kind of trigger some patch review, but I came across the one bug that I think we still have open, which I think impacts AR64 as an architecture more often than not. It's a generic issue, and it's in the um, atomics used for DL open, where you can get into a scenario where DL open always is slow. And it was like patch 14 out of a 14 series patch set, and I think at Hammerval act 13 of them, except for the last one. So the last one's still outstanding. Um, do we, th and I think, and that one might have even been an RFC, do we think we want to repost that and then just ha try to review it? Because I still think that there's probably a performance impact there with the atomics in those areas. And I know Wilco's been cleaning up the atomics, and thank you for that, Wilco. So the reason why I was not too keen on pushing that one patch is because that patch series fixed a number of um, kind of uh, concurrency logic <coughs> in in the dynamic linker, and I end up having like a relatively simple model of concurrency. Like there is a lock now, and the lock we take the lock when we have to take the lock, and so on. Everything is protected, and the last patch essentially messes up that model. Like uh, it 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 to to do the performancing, you have to uh, have to use atomics kind of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was less sure about that patch uh, to be correct. And uh, I remember there were multiple ways to do to that thing, um, but none of them seemed perfect um, so it's it's about uh, thread local storage access uh, in presence of like this yeah this, something with the open um, so w the the way I remember it is is there is a things of there are, there are a bunch of things that we have to go through, uh, and we fall into a slow pass, and and then we keep falling into a slow pass if after a deal open and we just stuck there. And to fix that, you could uh, fix it a number of ways, but it's. I remember it was a bit technical why why the reasoning why why it's not an obvious fix, and. Uh, I agree that it would be good to have because it is a real slowdown and uh, I just don't have a, so I have a way to have a patch but I'm not, I have to go back to again prove that this is the right thing to do. I, I just want to say Florian had his hand up so Florian can you unmute and hopefully you can speak and we can hear you. If you're speaking, we can't hear you. It should have been set up so that the laptop, the system doing the data can play out. I have no idea, and the technical guru has wandered off. Okay. <laughs> Just to double check, are you, yeah, you still have your hand up, Florian. Are you speaking? You are unmuted. I guess maybe I can unmute my laptop and make you come through my laptop. So. Can you hold that mic to the laptop speaker? And... 
All right, Florian, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Just about. Oh. I have a... He says he'll type it in the chat. Okay. He's a fast typer. Yeah, he says, please move on for now. Okay. No. Well, I could end the slide there. <laughs> but more realistically, what have we got next? Lib MVEC for AOH64. Kirill, do you want to start about that? I can probably talk a little bit about that. Um, so, uh, part of the project. come between the green lines? Yeah, so. Um, one of the projects uh, I, I lead, uh, well, it, it's performance optimizations and tools in general. One of the requests, we keep getting more and more of this to get Lib and back already on AR64. It's something that exists in other architectures, and we have users who would like to see that. Um, there are obviously various libraries like Sleeve and others that are uh, useful, but for general Linux adoption, if, it's, if we, people could use it from a normal platform toolchain, like new, no, it'll be very convenient. Uh, it's something we various people have worked on um, over the years, uh, both from ARM and from uh, uh, the OX system. Uh, so quite a lot of components are there. Um, so you know, the, we, we've defined a vector uh, PCS for passing the registers uh, the right way. Uh, we've got some uh, uh, routines in our ARM optimized routines project, which implement uh, some vector math, math stuff. Uh, there's a, anyway, uh, so we are looking to get all that uh, done some point in the future. Uh, we obviously need GLIPC and GC to agree on how to represent, how to expose these vector math routines. Um, uh, one request we did get recently was uh, whether we could get uh, LibMVec and GLIPC to get some math routines, uh, some vector math routines in there and expose them to the user uh, before the GC supports lands for auto vectorizing them. Uh, the idea being that uh, there are certain runtimes like we, Python and NumPy in particular were told that would like to generate the mangled vector symbols directly because they know what they're doing and they would like to be able to call them there. Uh, whereas I believe the GLIPC design such as it is now rather prefers to wait until GC can actually you know, generate those uh, uh, vector calls itself before it actually accepts subroutines. So, I uh, can take this opportunity to engage interest in the community if you'll be willing to accept uh, you know, some vector math routines with the exposed symbols for uh, non-GCC compiled programs to link against. Uh, I suspect asking Joseph or someone else that question, what do you think? What do you think? I sort of think this is like a question for the GLibC buff, but I also have something I'm wondering about the live vet question that might again be more suitable for the GLibC buff, which is how much all of these things need to be an architecture-specific assembly versus how much we can do things in C code maybe with some architecture-specific configuration rather than requiring so much architecture-specific assembly. Well, I endorse not using assembly whenever we can not uh, use assembly. Yeah, so I mean, our approach for writing these routines in, in the, our various internal libraries and all that is uh, with intrinsics. So they're not you know, architecture independent. And especially when you want to write the vector version of them, you kind of need to use the vector capabilities which, uh, for, on which we've relied on intrinsics, especially with things like SVE, which you, know, you want to use the predicate registers and all the other uh, stuff there. Um, so it's not assembly exactly, <laughs> but it's not exactly target independent either. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Joe. So we can take it to the GLIPC buff, but we can talk about some of the AR64 specific aspects. But like, the more assembly we delete, the better, right? Like, and I think at Hammerval also has like, um, there's the outstanding like fast string all in C implementations that still are faster than even some of the purported architecture specific implementations. So um, I'm with Joseph. I think there's some of the stuff we can write, and then we can do a, either a core kernel like a, of a 
of the implementation that's required to be in hardware, it's it's still just hard to do, right? Because this is basically trying to refactor what we can out of all the architecture implementations, delete as much assembly as we can, and then, then work forward. It's basically, it's a function of refactoring in many ways, the interfaces we have. Um, I will note Florian has a question, he had his hand raised, and I, have, I do have his question in writing. If we want to, if we want, I'm just saying there's a, another GLibc question, but um, uh, do we have any more questions about libmvec? Because we finished the libmvec question out, then I'll, I can ask, Florian can raise his no, question. No, not that one. Yeah. one. Does anyone else have a libmvec questions? I have a, a brief observation. You are growing HPC people on Darwin now. Um, you know, there are people doing weather modeling and stuff using the M1 chip, and it's giving pretty good answers, actually, pretty good performance, but it would be good to see uh, not to see that kind of swept away by it's only going to work on Linux. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not actually not familiar very well with uh, what the Darwin math library story is or how does one contribute to it or whether it is even it is open to contributions. But uh, it's pretty new, basically. Uh, there's always the ARM optimized routines as a route to, fu to publishing um, fairly general, uh, open um, ARM optimized versions of, of these codes. It tends to be written in assembler, a lot of it, rather, rather than in C, but in a few cases we may be able to push C-based algorithms. The, re the real problem for the vector code is actually expressing it efficiently in well, in generic C, it's probably nearly impossible because you just don't, can't describe the width. Um, and expecting the vectorizer to vectorize that sort of code is probably pushing it a bit. Um, but on the other hand, we could use intrinsics and then you get the benefit of the compiler doing all the hard register allocation and scheduling, which is the other bit that in general, it's very hard to write properly. and get the right expression of the of the algorithm whilst also dealing with all the scheduling issues. But that community is also happy to use vectorization like Well, the, the ARM optimized routines is, is um, fairly general. I mean, ARM, ARM controls it uh, because it's, it's ARM focused, but we'd probably ask, I think the, is it a fairly standard community in bind equals output and license? Um, I don't remember well, because you know. It's, it's multiple license. So. Yeah, it's, it's complicated because we need to be able to um, pass the implementations on to multiple C libraries with multiple different constraints. So actually, thinking about it, there's probably a copyright assignment because otherwise ARM can't do the, the relevant on, on, on licensing. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. There's an income sense how, how people can contribute to the thing and there's an outgoing license how mm. people can use our code and the outgoing license how people can use this code is very permissive it has MIT license and it's also available under the LLVM license so LLVM Lipsy can use it and we can contribute it under whatever license of the ARM people so yeah, yeah if that's not enough Any more on LibMVEC? Do we want to go to Florian's question? Sure. Um, Florian's question is stepping back to the earlier slight GLibc discussion, which is um, we're going to remove uh, legacy hardware cap support that drives uh, multi-lib path directory searching in favor of GLibc hardware caps, right? So that raises a question, which Florian is raising, um, that there used to be an atomics multi-lib directory for ARM, and is it still needed, or have outline atomics really become the path forward? So as far as I'm aware, nobody's using it. So I one time tested it that it does what I think it does, should do, and I, unfortunately it's now a part of AR64 GLibc. 
I think we can deprecate and nobody would notice, but I can't be sure because it's the usual thing is. Anyway, the history there is that people asked for like being able to not just use the base atomics, but use the new atomics, and that this was the first solution that we proposed, and that they, they and then people said they are not happy with this, and that the second solution was the outline atomics, which is much easier to deploy in distros for reasons, and uh, and yeah, that's what we have now. Um, so I guess uh, we can deprecate atomics uh, based the atomic directory lookup thingy. Next. Yep. Uh, yeah, I just want to point out, uh, <laughs> well, this is more of a related question for Jakob, but uh, I'll, I'll ask him on that as, uh, uh, when I see him. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, there's also, JLibc aside, there's also the question of how do we um, um, you know, expose the availability of these uh, uh, math routines to the GC auto vectorizer so it knows you know, which ones to use. Um, so we, there's been, <laughs> That, that's the thing that took us quite a long time to sort of sort out. Uh, and I think the solution where we expect to go with so far is to use the piggyback of this OpenMP declare variant uh, directive um, that should have enough expressibility to allow us to say that this uh, function has a vector variant and then that there says there's a neon variant, there's SVE variant and um, it, it all just about works together. Uh, we just need to hook it up in the implementation. Uh, so we have a engineer, Andre Vieira, uh, my team that uh, works on that. Um, so yeah, uh, once we kind of get a bit of agreement uh, with well, Jakob, um, that that's a okay thing to do. We'll probably go ahead and do that. Um, so once that is done and we get uh, you know, some JLPC routines in for a libenvec, uh, we should be able to get an initial um, work and implementation for auto vectorizing math routines with uh, GC and JLPC. Uh, there's also other stuff that we can talk offline about, uh, more hairy things like how do you deal with same cause and all these other custom ABIs, how do you make it more efficient, whether you want other variants for unrolling and whether there's other SIMD ISAs that you might want to consider, fixed length uh, SVE and whatnot, uh, those are all very deep topics uh, that we can sort out once we got the initial design uh, in a good shape. Uh, yeah, that's it on the back. Okay. Yeah, so the other thing in terms of making use of the ARM architecture we've got uh, is we're trying to look at function multi-versioning. Uh, also that's not new to GCC. Uh, x86 at least has it. I think PowerPC has it too. Um, anyway, uh, the idea is you tag uh, your functions with an attribute saying, I want multiple clones of this function for different ISAs, and then the compiler would generate the runtime um, checks for those ISAs, uh, for that ISA feature, and then do a dispatch. Um, we've had, had the request from multiple uh, parts of the ecosystem. Um, so we do have, uh, we have sort of designed the spec for you know, what exactly the standard, what, what the attributes will be, what the uh, ISA features, uh, how they all kind of tie together. Um, that's all defined in the RMC language extensions uh, document, the ACLE, which is, uh, uh, oh yeah, it is. There is a link to that. Yeah, it is, it is now public on GitHub. So. Um, so you know, we, we already got some feedback on this uh, from Martin uh, earlier this year. So we are also already working on the Clang plus LVM implementation. We have a patch and review now, and we will be working on the GC implementation uh, for the GC 14 timeframe, roughly. Um, so yeah, I, will be, I expect we'll be able to reuse a lot of the infrastructure in GC because uh, all of that target node saving and restoring, uh, that's all quite fiddly, but hopefully we shouldn't need to reinvent the wheel for a lot of it. Uh, 
that's it on that one. Any questions? For the list, you know, if we added a whole bunch of CPUs, um, it's probably not very exciting to talk about technically. Uh, ARM releases architecture and CPUs all the time. It would have been a long slide with no information uh, yeah, of any yeah, use. So. Yeah. I did consider I'll, writing it, I'll but it would have been a joke. for the marketing pitch for all of our <laughs> exciting IP. I'm going to read it off here because I'm getting a crick neck. Um, so this is a slide from Louis, who unfortunately can't make it this weekend. Um, some of the work that's been done in GDB, um, well, you can see the list. Um, perhaps one of the more interesting ones is the MTE support, which includes um, being able to, to have MTE information stored in a core file and recover that for GDB to analyze um, after the event. Um, support for the um, brain float, um, 16, uh, DFP, a bunch of things to do with M profile. Um, that's MVE is the mobile vector version. It's sort of a lightweight neon. Um, we've got pack BTI coming for M profile as well. The architecture is slightly different to the AOC 32, uh, sorry, the AOC 64 pack BTI in that um, there are no spare bits in a pointer register uh, being a 32 bit architecture. And so the pack code is stored in a separate register when you execute it. And that has two consequences. One is that you have to make sure you save and restore that information if you're in a leaf function. Oh, sorry, not in a leaf function. Um, and the other is actually the, the, there are 32 pack bits now rather than just a few stored in the top of the pointer, um, which means that in fact, it's, it's probably a more secure solution there than it can be on AF64. Um, we have other bits that are in flight, um, SVE enhancements, um, SME enablement and, uh, I think somebody is working on getting GDB to talk better with QEMU so that we can get get debug sessions looking more more like a real model. Or should I say more like a real piece of hardware? I think that's the last slide. Um, the only other thing that I've got is what do we do with MTE and glibc? Now that's an interesting one. It might be more relevant for the glibc buff, but it's a bit arm centric at the minute. Um, was it you who was asking that, Javox? Um, I mean, some of these things are forward-looking features for which we, at least I don't have often direct visibility into users using the hardware with these features turned on. Mm -hmm. So the question really becomes like, if you see people using it, I mean, it's okay. What do we want to do with it? We, is there something wrong with the current implementation? Do we want to improve it? How do we improve it? So I think there's those open questions, but yeah. right now, the I haven't seen any negative impact for the code that we have in there. It hasn't made it any harder to maintain those files. It's still pretty easy to go review that code. Um, I think maybe as I look at like doing some stuff with restartable sequences, I have to start thinking about, well, how does MTE play into there? What do I have to do? Does it have any impact? Like as, I re as code gets refactored or touched, then the questions become if MTE gets in the way of any of those modifications, is it problematic then? Yep. Um, but it, it's up to you. I mean, you as contributors upstream to the ARM hardware support. We're kind of looking at you guys to say, yeah, this was good or this was a good experiment because we've got it behind the tunable, right? So you can turn, we can turn it on and customers can play with it and users can play with it and people using the hardware can play with it. I think one of the issues is at present it's configured by default to off and it, therefore standard glibcs will come without it. Uh, Default to off entirely or default to on with the tunable off? 
I think it's default to not built in. Oh. It, certainly when I added the original code, it was experimental and the default was not to enable the, the code at all. Yes, yeah, so that was one question that uh, we had a configuration option that we don't even enable uh, memory tagging because it affects malloc layout essentially to, to enable the tagging support. And, uh, and then there is a runtime additional bit. But I think well, we asked distros to build glibc with this enabled so we can at least notice if our malloc changes break something. But those are only supposed to change kind of uh, a few minor things in the malloc layout. And then there's a separate runtime enable to enable actual tagging. Yeah, there's, there's essentially there's three levels at which it has to be enabled before it kicks in. Um, the first is your glibc has to be built with it, um, built in an MTE capable way. The second one is that the hardware has to be detected at runtime as MTE capable. And the third one is you then have to turn on the tunable in order to get to it. So there's quite a, quite a, quite a dance if you, if you want to enable it at present. Um, I think we're only talking about that first step. I think enable memory tagging. Um, it's, it was envisioned as a generic thing that other architecture might also want to support. So. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I guess, like, collect some data. <laughs> right. Your yep. Hardware. Well, this is a buff, right? Yeah. One of the ways to get the data is to advertise that it's there. Yeah. I mean, we can't, we can't tell you whether your application is going to work with MTE. We've, we know that there are some applications that um, do violate MTE requirements, um, Python was the first example that we ran into almost as soon as we turned it on, in that its allocator has an assumption that it can wander about within a page. Um, and particularly when you free something in Python, it tries to find the page that it's in to find out whether it's in its in malloc space or its own cache. Absolutely. So I will say that there are other CPU architectures that have complex features as well. Mm. And the way that we normally progress through this is you put something in the core runtimes, you turn it on with a tunable or something. And then you need to begin building everything in the distro because the distro is a great example for what customers it's and not users so, are going It's to be not doing. so much building everything and in the distro because it's all contained within glibc. This is about testing everything but, in the distro. Um, yeah. Let me take a step back. I'll, mm. I'll give you a for example. If I had hardware and I wired that hardware up to our Fedora copper build infrastructure and it had MTE and we turned it on, I could then use my, what we have as mass pre-build tooling to basically begin running the, a build of like the entire distro. Yeah. And the, the RPM side build for Python, for example, we'll build Python and then a check will run the entire test suite and we will see if that test suite passes or fails. Um, because at some point then later, you're going to keep building Python things, and it'll, do, it'll just all start aborting, right? Because if the interpreter is failing, then everything with the newly built Python is going to fail, and stuff is just all going to fall over, so you'll see it right away. Um, and to know if we, you can have that thing on, it is this brute force process of you begin doing all of this, then you find all the places where it's broken, and then you start fixing them. That's a lot of effort, mm -hmm. right? So you ha do have to ask yourself, like, is this a path you want to go down because the effort is worth the value or not? And that's, that's, a hard, like, that's just a high level strategic question to ask yourself. So like, um, I'll give you an example. We put um, CET in, which is very sim you know, similar, similar features as PAC BTI. Mm. When you turn PAC BTI on, I guarantee you, you begin to see issues in the distro and then you just have to work through those issues slowly through the, through the process. But it's definitely yeah. like a, um, your first level of 
interaction is with the distros. Because the distros have their builders, they have a build process, they, they have thousands of applications that yep. are going to become part of uh, uh, an environment that users are going to use. So like, if you have questions about MTE or questions about any other features you're enabling, I think interaction with the distros is one of the best ways to do this, experimentation mm. with the distros and working with the distro teams. Does that, I mean, maybe I should have asked, are you looking for advice or not? Or <laughs> this is a boff, so. It's a boff. <laughs> it's a, yeah, we, we've provided the, the feature for it to give value. It has to be enabled or enableable at runtime. Yeah. Um, and then to some extent, right, the standard uh, maxim applies. You can lead, lead a horse to, to water, but you can't make it drink. So in many ways right now, I'm like, the way we test experimental features, for example, is to, the strategy for testing experimental features is mass pre-building stuff in the distribution. Mm -hmm. um, copper is, uh, from the Fedora side, it's very similar to Ubuntu's universe in that you've got generic build infrastructure that you can then go feed things into the generic build infrastructure and, and use it. I don't, SUSE probably has a very similar kind of, you can feed anything to it. Build. Is there any SUSE people here? Um, but anyway, so yeah. But the thing is, you also have to have the hardware wired up to that infrastructure so that you can then do the mass builds on the Absolutely. hardware. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what we are currently using for hardware for copper for Air 64. I have to go look at one of the build logs. But um, do we? Does that make sense? Does that would that begin to answer some of the questions that you might have over whether the hardware feature is viable and it works? Or is it realistic to build? Uh, Fedora like distribution on QMU? Yes, absolutely. So if you could, you just take QMU, if you have QMU that has the specific features all turned on, you can install Fedora and then you could build a scripted process by which you, you know, you rebuild one package and then you start a, just a scripted what's called a, a mock build and mocks entire processes to build a system root out of the packages that come from the normal repo and then build the one thing that you want inside of it. Um, because you're going to, you're saying, because you need to do the build locally because it's your QAMU that has all the special magic hardware features turned on. Yeah, you, you, can, you can do a mock build, and then basically you just keep feeding, putting more things into the sysroot that mock is building into, and you keep feeding it the modified packages and putting them back in. It's not the greatest way from a reproducible build perspective, because um, some of the mass pre-build tooling we have is designed around copper and around copper's capacity to burst against multiple servers and things like that. But yeah, it'll just take you a long while to sit there and serialize your build, build a thing, put it back into the sysroot, build the next thing, and, and then keep going. You can do it. Yeah, absolutely. Fedora gives you all the tools. And if you want to try it, let's sit down together and we can, I can show you how to do an entire scripted build process for all the tools and you can see, start seeing what stuff falls over. So I think that the your friends now are the downstream distros because we have all like we have all the process in place for retesting and rebuilding and making sure that a thing works um, in a scriptable way. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, like uh, when you if, as you go up a level, you know, you're like, oh, I want I'm enabling hardware, but down a level, the distros have all this automation and, and tooling and stuff that you might not be familiar with, which is why I'm always you know we should distros and hardware manufacturers, we need to be friends and we need to work through those processes together. And so to answer your question then, is what you would want to do is build a glibc with MTE turned on by default, have a QME running with MTE, heart, MTE enabled, and then begin building things in it and have QMU simulating all the MTE stuff correctly? Yes? Yeah. Okay, I see you nodding your head yes for those that can't see you because you're not in the camera and can't hear you because <laughs> you're, you're over there. Okay. Yeah. For that, the benefit of the camera, works. the answer is nodding his head. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That works. Do you want to do that? 
<laughs> it's like, do you want to do that? Because again, it's like, it's work. Like, yeah. so you begin the first, it's like, you know, 30,000 packages. So you start at the beginning and you've got one built and the 30,000 package line is way at the very end. Now you don't have to build all of them. You can start with what's called uh, a critical path based packages. So there's an initial group of packages in Fedora that are considered critical path. And then we can build all those with MT and see if the critical path based packages fail, then you're hosed, your system's not, you're not gonna be able to even begin bootstrapping the system. Yeah. So if the critical path based packages build, then we're on to the next conversation. And normally when I, like when I do a glibc update, lately I've been doing a mass rebuild of critical path based packages to make sure they boot, they make sure they build and they work. And I know SUSE has also a, a base bootstrap set that they bootstrap in Tumbleweed that is a, like this critical set of packages that you can make sure you can build over again. But we're gonna hit Python right away because glibc needs it. So you, you need Python, you need a Python minimal. So is the Python issue fixed? I. Well, I, I certainly haven't been to fix it. I'm not aware that anybody ha has at this okay. stage. Because so then you're saying that the second we turn on MTE, as soon as you're going to build glibc, it's just going to fail? If, because... if you set the environment variable by default, yes, it will. <laughs> so then <laughs> it will this, be problematic. This whole exercise but... of having this conversation will just stop dead when <laughs> we get to Python. And then the question will be, who's going to fix Python? Unless we start having ways of building certain packages with annotations, which says, ignore the tunable and don't don't enable it for this package and then we get essentially runtime build checks uh, sorry runtime checks yeah. that okay so you build let's say you build python with tagging turned off well um, with with a flag that says don't turn it on at runtime you but but cuz it's it's a MT sure. is only done in glibc, and yeah. Yeah, unless or until Python is put, is updated, so it's essentially it's, it's memory management. So you're code. saying that you'd have Python actually? You, we, we'd have to write a patch for Python to turn off MT at runtime. We'd have to write a patch, or, or something that the dynamic loader would read would read as a tag in the binary that says ignore oh. uh, as some sort of attribute. Yeah, uh, I don't want to use the term build attribute because that. It's no, 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 build attributes are for, for static link time. For something, so yeah. there are, uh, you know, GNU notes that we use for other things and yes. other architectures that the dynamic loader can load and it knows about them. And you could say, one of those notes could be, don't run MTE because this piece of application is not MTE yeah. safe. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's the same as the CET notes in, or PAC PTI notes as well. The, some of those notes are composable. Um, in a certain way. And Florian writes, we'll probably need some form elf markup to identify shared objects which are compatible with MTE. I bits must always be zero. Bits can be any value, but are not necessarily preserved, the, the, the tricky bit is the decision of whether it's an opt-in or opt-out, because generally speaking, you would probably want MTE to be on, except when you know that the problem has been um, analyzed and shown to be um, a real, pro um, not a, a, a bug in the program. Yeah. Because if MTE defaults to off, actually, most programs don't get checked, mm -hmm. which defeats the point of it. Sure. But so, I mean, in glibc, you generally control, like, we're going to start using MTE for these things. And, well, is it, are we back to, um, is MTE per process? Yes. Okay, good. Right. So then I can start up a container or something that uses MTE. And so it's top level process and that container has MTE turned on and all the children that that process has will have MTE turned on unless the dynamic loader sees a, uh, you know, a note that is, an, is a, you know, a runtime note that the loader loads and then sees and then, then we turn MTE off. Uh, yeah, I mean, MTE has to be enabled by the kernel per yep. process. Yep. Um, it has to be, um, for MTE to work, that the memory has to be MTE taggable. Um, but there's a general assumption in the kernel that um, either all memory is taggable or no memory is taggable. There are parts of the application which can't be tagged because the kernel doesn't support tagging um, the BSS, um, the, the initial um, uh, break extendable t uh, memory. So in MTE, when we turn that on in, in, for malloc, 
we switched to the MMAP versions for all for all allocations. Um, is there another limitation? Yeah, we don't currently support MTE on the stack, but that could come as a later date, I think. But it, as soon as you get MTE on the stack, you run into the position where you can't have a binary that's portable to older machines. The glibc code can runtime detect because it can put everything through that's relevant through f function points or dynamic checks. Running MTE checks on every single function on entry and exit in order to determine whether to clean up the stack or not would probably make it so expensive as to not be viable as a standard deployment. You'd probably turn it on as a debugging aid, much like you would do uh, some of the other checkers that we have. We've probably exhausted that one. Yeah, I think so. Well, yeah. At least for now. It sounds like as soon as you build GLC, though, in this whole process that we've talked about building with the thing, you're just going to need the pipeline first. And therefore, you need the L markup. And we have already a whole process in, in LDSO to do that markup processing and analysis. Mm. There is a second, and we have access to it, and we can use allocatable, and we can load it, and you can access it. You make me sad. <laughs> yes, because I'm not entirely happy with the way new properties turned out. It's uh, user interface is not uh, very ergonomic. Uh, uh, the linker magically combines these, but you don't really have a fine-grained control over how you, uh, if you want to override that. And same in the assembly level when you have assembly files. If you want to mark some assembly, uh, some object code that generated from assembly uh, uh, with some property, you don't have good uh, user interface there. You have to write some directives into the assembly file and these sort of problems. Um, I so so if you expect a lot of widely widely used packages to require some magic marker and we have to go there and convince them to put all of these my, in their my inclination, files yeah. a bit, uh, My inclination for that would be the default is to assume that things are MTE clean unless you tell them otherwise. Right. Um, and that way you don't have to go around and rebuild every single object file before you can enable MTE. But to, to do that, though, that much, you basically need a compiler flag and the compiler flag has to say, I'm not MTE clean, compile everything. Or even a build attribute, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, a function attribute inside the source code that says not tagging compatible. Sure. Yeah. I would say, like, what we've learned is to propagate it through build systems, you got to be able to put it in a flag somewhere. Then, or if you have a function attribute, sure, that needs to go down. And then when you, you need to define the semantics of what happens, it has to somehow end up as metadata that a loader can load. And so we, we have examples of how to do that now. We can do it differently if you want, but we, there has to be value in that difference, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you, if you don't like the way it's done today, yeah, it's a bit crufty, but it is metadata in the binary that we can load with the loader, analyze it, and then take an action in the dynamic loader based on that, that data. Um, and the static linker makes a decision about what it does with that information on a, as it assembles the object files and puts it all together. I think Binutils has custom code for all that stuff because the, the semantics are slightly different in each one. So, Alex has a question or a comment. Uh, yeah, this might be a bit naive, but I'm just wondering, like, um, why haven't we tried to fix Python? Is there? Um... 
I, it seems like uh, well, it would be an per interesting Personally place. speaking, I've just not had time to go and look at it. Uh, I don't know whether we have contribution sure. things sorted out for Perhaps doing work on Python. Perhaps um, other teams in ARM, though, might be interested. Perhaps in other teams way. in ARM could, but I, I'm not aware that anybody has gone and looked at it. Right. I, I think it's fairly fundamental to its, its getting good performance out of the memory system with yeah, Python I, objects. It's not about fixing it. They have a solution that they like. I think it might be even possible to turn off at configuration time, but that's not how distros build Python, because I think Valgrin needs it as well to properly work because Python does magic with malloc and and if you want to catch memory bugs you have to, that it has an option to be more more proper use of malloc but then it's slower basically, basically the problem is in order to avoid calling malloc all the time it has its own mini allocator and when you free a Python object, it first looks to see whether it, that object lies in one of its own mini allocator pages. And if it is, it releases it that way. And if it's not, it calls free to free the object through the normal system. But as soon as you've got MTE, as soon as you try to free an object that is um, actually allocated through malloc, you can't go and read the page header for the object that that's in. Uh, because it's not valid to, to look at random places elsewhere in the page. So you, you either need to put in some special annotations to say, um, do this in, the, in a way that doesn't do the tag checking, or you need to do other, other ways of restructuring the code. It would be fixable. Um, there's no reason why it can't be done. Um, I think it's valuable also, though, to just be capable of putting this markup in place right away because mm. you don't know what else is busted. And so you spend all this time trying to fix Python and then a million other things are busted. And so really, like, being able to walk the distro gives you a good evaluation of mm. where else are there problems. So you do this first pass and you look at, okay, all these things built, all these things are broken, and then now you go back and you look at them. And Python's one you've already evaluated, but there's going to be a lot more that you probably want to look at so in many ways, the markup helps you do that. And the markup's also a way out for customers well, the, the, or the, users they haven't the, written The there. markup really is a stopgap because you, if you've, the, the thing is, if you, if you disable MTE because the allocator can't, can't handle it, any other violations elsewhere in the program won't be found either. So ideally, you would fix the allocator to work properly in an MTE environment. Yeah, but um, I, ideally as a function of user, user resources, absolutely, yes. exact machines yeah. that they're using. And so I, I wouldn't go as far to call it a stopgap. I would go as far as saying that some of these hardware features just need ways to have them not on. And that needs to be often a compositional issue of like components in the system. So you assemble a bunch of components to do a thing for your workload, and it turns out one of those components just doesn't support the feature that you want. So there needs to be a way to possibly turn on that feature because the composition now can't support that feature. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, speaking personally again, yeah. um, I would see, you know, long term, if MTE does survive and, mm -hmm. and take off, it would almost get bound to um, SE Linux type security levels. And you might say, I insist that all programs yes. run with MTE enabled yeah. um, because I don't, I, my security level says that that's the level of security I need out of things running on the system. Maybe that's not exactly the right, the right way, but something of that nature could be mm -hmm. a policy level of, of the machine, depending on your trust levels. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, in, in that case, uh, SE Linux ha is going to have to enforce that whenever glibc tries to turn MTE off. How do we turn MTE off right now? Is there a, like I said? Uh, I shouldn't think, yeah, we've done the work to enable that sort of thing yet. It's, yeah. uh, no, but it's, I'm saying it's so, but so then from a policy perspective, yeah. the SE Linux on the kernel side is going to prevent that syscall from succeeding. And 
you're going to get an error back from that syscall, and then LDSO just terminates the process and says, mm. you know, well, I tried to turn it off, but I couldn't, so sorry. I can't, because there needs to be an answer to, although the markup was there to turn it off, if the policy said that it wasn't, then I, and I try to turn it off, and so, and SE Linux needs to work, I mean, the process needs to work no matter what, and it needs to be terminated yeah. if it doesn't meet those requirements. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe SE Linux, as, as currently structured, is not the right answer, because at, pr at present, you probably can't enforce that binaries d enable the markup. You could always drink, link in a different malloc that didn't have memory tagging to get around the, the fact that the, the glibc one has that. Um, in fact, the general problem, and, and, and I suspect this will be the case, is that the applications that fail under MTE for well, while still being valid programs, as opposed to genuine bugs, will be those that are trying to do their own manage memory management, exactly like Python does. So Emacs is probably going to be another one that doesn't yeah, work and when you... Ruby will as well, because yeah. it has a... Well, I guess not. If you don't use Ulipsis malloc... If it doesn't use malloc, then it probably wouldn't hit the problem. If it's using mmap for all its, yeah, it's Ruby blocks. uses mmap for everything now yeah. with the latest Ruby. And that had to do with the fact that it used to use glibc malloc, but they want exact 4K pages with no metadata used in those 4K pages. So yeah. for their and, and for them, if they want MTE support, they would have to embed they it to in their it. own yeah. memory allocator system. Yeah. Okay. So it, going back we, to Zabos, is this, this just a question of just <coughs> doing some QMU tests and some build tests? Or is this, not really, because that's, that's all, just always going to fail. So I guess the real question is defining for ARC64 what you want to express in the dynamic loader and its semantics for hardware features that have this kind of compositional issue, right? You have to express those. Well, at one level, I don't think it's what I want or what ARM wants. It's what the community wants out of this. You know, we provide the hardware, yeah. you decide how you use those features to get the best security or debuggability or whatever out of the system. Yeah, Sidesh yells system-wide tunables with markup as an exception to allow specific applications to work without MTE. Sure, yeah. I think we want the markup. I think when the dynamic loader has to make a really early decision about this. But it's it, up can, the, it can technically turn it off after it's been turned on, it can, I think, turn it off after it's been on, um, so but actually, it can't turn it back on again, have, having turned it off. Yeah, so what actually happens, we, we don't, it, by, you start by turning it turned off and you have to explicitly turn it on. So you have to opt in, essentially. Mm. Uh, anyway, what I just wanted to say is, yes, it's, uh, it's a pos possibility that oh, we just have to have markings. My other problem with markings is that the semantics is not at all trivial because we can have markings like MT, and it's not just MT because we have a long list of architecture features that can use some kind of markings. But you can have things like, oh, this binary uses the top bits of pointers, or this binary uh, assumes 4K uh, or page, page granularity, granularity protection. And those, those uh, will fail with MT in different ways. So you can have like multiple different markings. You can have one specific MT marking, or you can have like a higher level marking that uh, can be used by things like HWSN and other similar things. Uh, so one of the reasons we didn't try to do anything with markings because it's not an obvious design on how, how mm. to do that. Yeah. And then we can iterate and then we can need. Yeah. We're pretty much out of time. Any questions on ARM as opposed to ARH64? Nope, in which case I think we're done. Oh, Carol. You were nearly out of time. Well, what do you think we should deprecate next? Sorry? What do you think we should deprecate next? Um, uh, V4, so that's strong arm. <laughs> <laughs> Is it time for that to go? 
IWMXT. Sorry? IWMXT. IWMX. Is anybody still using Xscale? Uh, Nick's not in the room, so he was the, uh, the maintainer for that. So I can't ask him whether anybody, he's, he's still interested in maintaining that. 4T, not a chance. Not a chance. No, not, not yet. Arm still sips a lot of 70 DMI products. Well, sorry, I shouldn't say arm ships. Arms partners ship a lot of 70 DMI based products even today. I don't know how widely they are used in new designs and therefore how relevant it is for GCC to carry on supporting it. But until I'm told very distinctly otherwise, 40 is not on the option list for removal. And to be honest, even if we did, it would probably only take us to 5T and the differences are not that huge. There are one or two useful things that we could assume like interworking, but um, that's about the only one that's Broken is probably not the word, not implemented is what the word I would use. But <laughs> right, well, thank you, everyone. We've filled the hour somehow. <laughs>